Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. As part of our series on Stalin, today's episode is The Great Terror, Part 1, Devouring the Children. Like Saturn, the revolution devours its children. This phrase was coined by Jacques Dupin, a French royalist during the era of the French Revolution. During the Great Terror, Robespierre and Saint-Just, both intellectual, idealistic men, were convinced of the necessity for the revolution's survival for their old allies to be liquidated. The men who had stormed the Bastille and triggered the original revolution, such as Georges Danton and Camille Desmoulins, would be executed on vague, trumped-up charges. Lenin and Stalin had admired Robespierre's insistence that the revolution had to occur hand-in-hand with terror. History doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes a lot of the time. On the 19th of August, 1936, 16 demoralised and broken men made their way into the Grand October Hall in the House of Unions in Moscow. Amongst them were the star defendants of Zinoviev and Kamenev, these men who had rubbed shoulders with Lenin and played crucial roles in the early stages of the revolution. They were to be put on trial, accused of orchestrating one of the most extraordinary conspiracies in political history. These men, former prominent Bolsheviks, were accused of organising a vast and shadowy secret movement, collaborating with the Germans, Mensheviks and other suppressed political parties and forces within Russia. Not only that, but even when they had been storming the Winter Palace in 1917, they were accused of having been secret agents in the pay of the British government. Why exactly the British government would want to overthrow the Tsar and replace him with a Bolshevik party that immediately pulled out of the war with Germany, thus freeing up German armies to fight in the trenches against the British, was never really explained. The crimes that they were accused of? Plotting the assassination of Stalin and a whole host of his underlings, and succeeding in the assassination of Kirov in 1934, with the ultimate aim of overthrowing the Soviet state in a vast counter-revolution. This was no ordinary trial. We've already discussed how the judicial branch of government in Russia had always been an arm of the executive branch, and how the Bolsheviks had used it to fulfil their political goals. But the great Moscow trials at the start of the Great Terror took this to new heights. It was no trial at all, but a piece of political theatre. Every single one of the defendants confessed to the crimes they were accused of in full. Indeed, five out of the sixteen defendants were plants from the NKVD secret police, whose sole purpose was to implicate the others. The case against Zinoviev and Kamenev were full of holes. Stalin had written the charge sheet and the confessions himself. Montefiore describes him as, quote, revelling in his hyperbolic talent as a hack playwright. And you can imagine the Machiavellian glee of the artist getting to manipulate the script, forcing his old adversaries to humiliate themselves and dance around like puppets. After all, what could be a finer show for the politically theatric than having your enemies condemn themselves and support your conspiracy theories? Here, in Stalin, I feel like we see the Georgian code of conduct of his school days. We see his ability and desire not to just defeat his opponents, but to crush them utterly. There's more to it, though. If an enemy dies unrepentant or languishes in prison for dissent, they might be remembered as a martyr. But if they're forced to confess to opposing Stalin to undermine the state, and being in the pay of capitalists and so on, doubt is thrown on them and their criticisms are discredited. So we see the vengeful Georgian abrek of the mountains, but we also see the prima donna who threatened resignation multiple times to receive reassurance from Lenin. We see the fan of drama. The reality, as Stalin surely knew even as he was writing up the charge sheets, was that this grand conspiracy was impossible. Perhaps Zinoviev and Kamenev had access to grind, and maybe they were even on the lookout for opportunities to foment revolution against Stalin, but the ludicrous charge sheet against them was filled with conspiracies that Stalin himself surely did not believe as he was writing them. So this was less about dealing with a genuine perceived threat and more about humiliating old rivals and sending a message to new ones about what happens when you dare to defy Stalin's power. There was no material evidence against them, except, bizarrely, a forged passport from Honduras that was supposedly evidence that Zinoviev and Kamenev had been communicating with the exiled Trotsky. The case presented by the authorities had glaring logical holes. For example, The court was told that Trotsky's son had ordered the assassinations in the Hotel Bristol in Denmark, but it turned out this hotel had been demolished in 1917. Stalin was furious with this embarrassing lapse, which did little to convince the few foreign journalists present that the charges were genuine. He shouted, What the devil did you need the hotel for? You should have said the railway station. The railway station is always there. Yet despite these obvious errors and the lack of evidence, the defendants made complete and grovelling confessions of guilt. Lev Kamenev said, I, Kamenev, together with Zinoviev and Trotsky, organised and guided this conspiracy. My motives? I had become convinced that the party's, Stalin's policy, was successful and victorious. We, the opposition, had banked on a split in the party, 
but this hope proved groundless. We could no longer count on any serious domestic difficulties to allow us to overthrow Stalin's power. We were actuated by boundless hatred and lust for power. Grigory Zinoviev also confessed, I would like to repeat that I am fully and utterly guilty. I am guilty of having been the organiser, second only to Trotsky, of the bloc whose chosen task was the killing of Stalin. I was the principal organiser of Kirov's assassination. The party saw where we were going and warned us. Stalin warned us scores of times, but we did not heed these warnings. We entered into an alliance with Trotsky. End quote. The reason for these confessions, of course, was that both men had been subjected to prolonged psychological torture by the NKVD. Stalin's order to the NKVD had been simple and cold. Mount your prisoner and do not dismount until they have confessed. End quote. Yezov, the poison dwarf who was rapidly rising towards becoming the head of the NKVD, promised the witnesses their lives and the safety of their families in exchange for these dramatic confessions and for testifying against their fellow Bolsheviks. The great soullessness of the Soviet state and the Kafkaesque nature of being accused by it, was known to Stalin, and illustrated in a conversation he had with one of the policemen during the confessions. Stalin. You think Kamenev may not confess? Policeman. I don't know. Stalin. You don't know? Do you know how much our state weighs with all the factories, machines, the army with all the armaments and the navy? Think it over and tell me. Well, nobody can know that, Joseph Vissenarianovich. It is in the realm of astronomical figures. Well, and can one man withstand the pressure of that astronomical weight? No, Comrade Stalin. Very well, then. Do not return until you have the confession of Kamenev. The secret deal that these men had made with the NKVD is revealed by Kamenev's final remarks in the trial, which are telling. They required to play their parts in the drama right until the end, of course, but Kamenev veered off script. He said, I should like to say just a few words to my children. I have two children. One is an army pilot, the other a young pioneer. Whatever the sentence may be, I consider it just. Together with the people, follow where Stalin leads. End quote. By referring to his sons as loyal servants of the state, Kamenev clearly hoped that they would be spared. It is very likely at this stage that he knew any promises made about his own life weren't going to be kept. Not that it did him any good to please for his family's life, because both boys would later be shot. On the other side of the trial was the special prosecutor, Bashinsky, who had once shared a cell with Stalin. This man, who Western journalists described as resembling a prosperous stockbroker, launched into vicious attacks on the defendants, designed to whip people up into a frenzy. In his summing up, he cried, quote, These mad dogs of capitalism try to tear limb from limb the best of our Soviet land. I demand that these mad dogs be shot, every one of them. End quote. This fury was echoed in Pravda's headlines the next day. Crush the loathsome creatures. The mad dogs must be shot. So as you can see, Pravda was fractionally worse than the Daily Mail. The attempt to whip up public fury and outrage, and thus unite the people of the USSR against a common enemy, fits in with everything we've said about the Bolshevik siege mentality. The system, to an extent, needed people to unite against and persecute. Justifications of the fanaticism and harsh wartime social and economic policies. And ultimately, it needed people to blame for the gap between the socialist dream and the reality of the socialist state. It reminds me a little bit of some of the politics of today. Obviously, the Bolsheviks did not campaign politically per se. They rejected democracy and the Duma parliament when it no longer suited their aims. But they did appeal to the people, and they did so on this platform of a revolutionary struggle against a common enemy. It was this fanatical idea of the struggle that motivated them throughout the civil war. Being a defender of the revolution was key. The same attitude was brought to economic policy, where fanaticism was still the order of the day. The Stakhanovite movement, which flourished under the five-year plans, where individual workers were celebrated for completing impossible feats of coal mining or steel production, was a prime example of this. The original Stakhanov was a man who'd broken the record for coal mining, although it turned out that he did so with the use of some additional equipment, so the goal that he set for others to follow was just ridiculous and not especially fair. Idealism about the revolution and paranoia about it being undermined, they went hand in hand. Like so many figures who promise radical change, and then suddenly find themselves in a position of power. The Bolsheviks found that it was easier to rail against enemies than to construct the paradise that they'd promised and dreamed of. The politics of the outsider movement don't always adapt well to holding the reins of authority in a vast state like Russia. So, just as Stalin had frantically pursued power and radical economic change, he now fanatically wreaked vengeance upon his enemies within the Bolshevik party. <laughs>
If you've ever suffered from insomnia, maybe on the day before a big exam or job interview, you can probably imagine perhaps a thousandth of what the trial defendants felt. The guilty verdict, when it came, came with the inevitability of the rising sun and the bird song informing you that it's time to face another day. But for these men and women, it would be their last day. Stalin was holidaying in Sochi, and three hours later, he ordered the executions of the prisoners. Stalin never personally attended torture or executions, but he knew plenty of men who were willing, if not eager, to carry out the work. In reading about this, I often wonder how I would react to the knowledge that I was about to be executed. It's one of those human experiences that's happened across the generations in countries across the world, having that knowledge that in a few hours you'll die a violent death. Charles I, when he was about to be executed by Parliament, spent the night with his family and slept a little. Louis XV, when he was due to be executed by French revolutionaries, spent his time reading about Charles I, the one man who might feasibly know what he was going through. There's a universality to death which unites all human beings. There's that famous Bukowski quote about it. We're all going to die, all of us. What a circus. That alone should make us love each other, but it doesn't. We are terrorised and flattened by trivialities. We are eaten up by nothing. End quote. And a lot of people were going to be eaten up by nothing in the Great Terror. I guess it's one of those questions, like a lot of moral dilemma questions, where there's probably a gap between what we say we'd do and what we fear we'd do. Apparently, Zinoviev and Kamenev were at opposite ends of the spectrum. Kamenev stoically accepted his fate and told Zinoviev to die with dignity, while Zinoviev begged and pleaded with the guards to call Stalin, who'd promised to save their lives. The end result for both of them was the same. They were shot through the back of the head. This fate is echoed in George Orwell's 1984, A Denunciation of Stalinism, where Winston Smith, the protagonist, writes in his diary feverishly, They'll shoot me, I don't care, they'll shoot me, I don't care, they'll shoot me in the back of the neck, I don't care, they always shoot me in the back of the neck, I don't care. Apparently, the bullets were retrieved, cleaned, labelled Zinoviev and Kamenev, and kept by Yagoda, the current head of the NKVD. As for Stalin, he didn't watch these executions himself. But, just like the monarchs of old, he had his court jesters who'd entertain him. In this case, his personal bodyguard's head, Pauka, would entertain him. It's symbolic of power having other humans specifically attempt to amuse you, isn't it? Pauka performed for Stalin and Zinoviev, begging for his life and reciting Jewish prayers, and according to Montefiore, quote, Stalin was almost sick with merriment and waved at the man to stop. It's a little sickening to imagine him taking such perverse pleasure in the execution of someone who'd once been his ally and friend. As a young man, Stalin had been awestruck by Kamenev speaking, in the early days of his revolutionary career when he was stuck in that tiny room in the astrological seminary. Now he laughed at the deaths of the old Bolsheviks he'd once admired. The trial of the Sixteen, as the first of the Moscow show trials was called, was not the end of this attack on the Trotskyite counter-revolutionary bloc. Trotsky, for his part, was in exile, but under house arrest in Norway, and he was unable to speak out about the trial as news from Russia filtered through to him. He was sentenced to death in absentia, and powerless to help his allies in Russia, although Stalin wasn't able to have him killed... yet. The first show trial was just the beginning, the defendants had all been forced to implicate the next set of victims for the next show trial. These were mainly figures from the right opposition, such as Bukharin, Rykov and Tomsky. Tomsky saw the writing on the wall and committed suicide as soon as he was implicated in the trial, probably to avoid the humiliation of false confession and implicating his friends. Stalin was reportedly furious, especially when the suicide was compared to that of Nadia. Tomsky's suicide would serve another purpose in the Great Terror. His suicide note mentioned that Yagoda, the current head of the NKVD, was friendly with members of the right opposition. The man in charge of investigating Tomsky's suicide who found this note? Well, it was Yezov, the poisoned dwarf, always trying to spin the situation to his advantage. Casting suspicion on Yagoda, and eventually outright attacking him for being complacent, Yezov got his way and was appointed head of the NKVD in September, with Stalin saying that Yagoda was not up to the task of exposing the Trotskyites. Some of the figures on the right, including Bukharin, felt that Yezov's appointment signalled that the terror was over, but in fact, we know with hindsight, it was only just beginning. The NKVD was a vast organisation with incredible powers, and its head was likely the only person whose personal power and influence could begin to rival that of Stalin's in the USSR. Yet this dismissal of Yagoda showed that not even this body was immune from Stalinist persecution. Lakoba, another candidate for the job of NKVD head, refused, preferring to stay in his region of Russia, Abkhazia, where he enjoyed considerable popularity. 
Lacoba was invited to dinner with Beria, the serial rapist who'd wielded the axe in Stalin's garden and promised to cut down any tree that Stalin wanted him to. That very night, Lacoba fell deathly ill, and a few hours later he died of a heart attack, aged just 43. His doctors were convinced that he was poisoned. Beria had the body cremated and Lacoba's entire family was killed. Stalin, musing to himself in a meeting of the Politburo, he often liked to scribble on a pad of paper in front of him. Well, around the time of this, he scribbled, Poison, poison. The Bolshevik party was turning on its own. Much like the Great Terror of the French Revolution, the atmosphere for this massive persecution and paranoia was at least in part set up by foreign conditions. After all, remember that a whole long list of capitalist countries tried, without much enthusiasm or commitment, but tried, to intervene in the Russian Civil War as anti-communists. Hitler came to power in 1933, broadly on the back of anti-communism for the German people, and you can argue that the same atmosphere of polarisation that made communist governments possible really drove the rise of fascism in Europe. Hitler had stated that communism was a menace and that the Soviet Union should be destroyed. Even more broadly, for an ideological Bolshevik who knew as Marx well, the global revolution that they had dreamed of had not manifested itself. The system wasn't supposed to work this way. Even in Stalin's own mind, and the rhetoric he delivered to the public, we'll remember that one key aspect of the propaganda of the five-year plans is that any failures to meet targets were down to wreckers and saboteurs. By pointing endlessly to the internal enemy, and fears of a fascist fifth column in any war that the five-year plan was so brutal in order to justify, Stalin was laying the ideological groundwork for the terror. Fears of counter-revolutionary threats, wreckers, saboteurs. They were at least partially justified, but they'd been given a very wide airing. Bukharin, in these unsettled times, having been demoted to low positions, took to bombarding Stalin with letters, pleading for his life. Quote, I am not me. I can't even cry on the body of an old comrade. Koba, I can't live in such a situation. I really love you passionately. I wish you quick and resolute victories. Stalin, of course, never replied, but he read every letter. He would often scrawl crank, big child, or ha 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 in the margins. Bukharin was almost toyed with in a cat and mouse way, while Stalin orchestrated further and deeper purges against his former allies. Bukharin met with one of those who was currently on trial, and imagine that, walking around Moscow, seeing people who were on trial, knowing that you'd be next. He saw Payatakov and described him to his wife. Quote, Living remains, not of Payatakov, but of his shadow, a skeleton with his teeth knocked out. End quote. In the next show trial, former industrialists who'd been charged of the first five-year plan, like Radek and Payatakov, were the defendants. This, then, was the trial of the anti-Soviet Trotskyist centre, Radek, whose sparkling wit had led him to be credited with many of the anti-Stalin Soviet jokes, and who was an active member of the left opposition, read his script, which laid the groundwork for a much wider purge to come. Radek confessed to being involved in this Trotskyist plot to overthrow the state, but he also described semi-Trotskyites, quarter-Trotskyites, one-eighth Trotskyites, people who helped us, not knowing of the terrorist organisation but sympathising with us, people who from liberalism, from a fronde against the party, gave us this help. But what did it mean to be one-eighth Trotskyite? In effect, it was the same as what it meant to be a kulak during collectivization. The enemy was shadowy, hazy, ill-defined. Therefore, anyone who resisted, or even showed signs that they might resist, was now somehow part of the conspiracy. Nikita Khrushchev, a rising star in the party, addressed feverish crowds in Moscow. Quote, By raising their hand against Comrade Stalin, the Judas Trotsky and his bloc have raised their hand against the best that humanity has, because Stalin is our hope, Stalin is our banner, Stalin is our will, and Stalin is our victory. End quote. The prominent Bolshevik, Odzgonikidze, realising that Stalin's purges were focused on his deputies and knowing that he'd be next, shot himself through the heart, exactly as Naja had done. The symbolism of the gesture is obvious. His death was formally announced as a heart attack. He avoided the fate of some of his fellow Bolsheviks and was permitted a state funeral. Bukharin was not so fortunate. He refused to shoot himself, as he felt that it would be an admission of guilt. He had seen the fates of Zinoviev and Kamenev, and did not want to face his own fate with the same lack of dignity, forced to confess and lie about his own actions. He knew he was going to die, as the net shrunk around him, and he behaved accordingly. He dictated his final testament to his wife, Anna, but told her not to write it down, merely to remember it, in case it was used against her as evidence. Anna, who later detailed their life together in her memoirs, described the moment when they knew they were parting for the last time, when Bukharin's arrest went through. 
His final words to her were, See, you don't get angry, Anyutka. There are irritating misprints in history, but the truth will triumph. She says, We understood that we were parting forever. Anna herself would at first be exiled, then arrested and sent to the Gulag in 1938. She would spend the next 15 years in various prison camps and forced labour camps, until Stalin's death when she was freed. She then began a political crusade to have Bukharin exonerated, which finally resulted in success in 1988, when he was rehabilitated and cleared of all charges. At this point, Anna was 74 years old. Yezov, the poisoned dwarf, was now relishing his role in charge of the NKVD, advising those who worked under him not to be too concerned about the innocent or the guilt of the victims of the terror. He said, There will be some innocent victims in this fight against fascist agents. We are launching a major attack on the enemy. Let there be no resentment if we bump someone with an elbow. Better that ten innocent people should suffer than one spy get away. When you chop wood, chips fly. End quote. He was backed up by the ever unbiased Pravda, which published a song for the NKVD to sing as they arrested people. Um, I'm going to quote the lyrics, I don't think I'll sing to you. The entire Soviet people helps us to chop down the enemy's claws, to cut down the enemy's teeth, to destroy the nests of the enemy with fire. We will defend our Soviet country in the Yezov manner. Hey, enemies, you can't fa- hide your malicious faces in new masks. You can't escape from our stern Yezov grip of steel. Crawling reptiles cannot slither stealthily to the heart of the motherland. Our untiring people's commissar discovers all with a sharp-eyed glance. We are the defence of millions. We are the defence of the whole country. From traitors, spies, inciters of war. To saboteurs, no mercy. End quote. Catchy, right? For Bukharin, too, there was no mercy. This fiercely intellectual man, whom Lenin had described as the darling of the whole party, and who Stalin had called Bukharchik as a term of endearment, was imprisoned for over a year in a Lubyanka prison, a vast and grand austere building that was like the Bastille of the Soviet Union. He attempted to go on hunger strike, which Stalin described as blackmail, and he wrote, a lot, apparently over 200 poems and an autobiographical novel, How It All Began, which was never finished. It ends ominously mid-sentence. Bukharin's approach to his show trial was a little different. Like everyone else, he was well aware that his family had been imprisoned and could be executed. He made a full confession to being a Trotskyite and trying to restore capitalism to the USSR. But he refused to confess to individual, specific crimes, like the murder of Kirov. All he'd say is that he took complete responsibility for the activities of the bloc, while evading questions on the specifics. Obviously nothing Bukharin said could possibly change his fate, but it's clear that he wanted to make some act of protest. Reading a transcript of Bukharin's testimony, which you can do online, is very odd. The intellectualism shines through, as he almost pontificates endlessly in a vague confession of these counter-revolutionary crimes. It's littered with almost minor points of doctrine. Allow me to continue this thought, comrades, and as incredibly verbose and eloquent as his writings often were, even when he was confessing to entirely fictional crimes. Vyshinsky, in his dogged manner as chief of show trial theatrics, summed up, His words serve as a good reminder that Stalin is attempting to discredit any intellectual opposition to his rule, past and present, as motivated by foreign powers and dishonest. Quote, Exactly one year ago, Comrade Stalin analysed deficiencies in our work, and arrived at the conclusion that the Trotskyite hypocrites must be liquidated. This direction he outlined in an article he wrote, in which he stated two words on the deviants, saboteurs, spies and others. Trotskyites and Bukharinites, Your Honour, this whole right-wing Trotskyite bloc whose leadership is now in the dock is not a political party. It is not a political movement. This bloc has no ideological content, nothing intellectual, as was the case with earlier members of this clique. Now it is sunk into the fetid ground of underground spies. This is a fifth column, a Ku Klux Klan, which has opened the door to the enemy, who is a sniper from a secret perch, who wants to help invading enemies conquer our villages and cities, who wants to contribute to the defeat of their own country. It is clear that these so-called masters must be mercilessly crushed and destroyed. End quote. Despite his vague confession, Bukharin maintained his innocence in letters to Stalin, written in the same effusive and gushingly emotional tones of his earlier letters. Again, Stalin never formally responded to the desperate Bukharin, but we can infer what he thought of the letters from two pieces of historical fact. The first is that when his desk was searched after his death, one of the three letters he kept, you'll remember there was one from Lenin referring to Stalin yelling at his wife, was from Bukharin. In it, he calls Stalin by his childhood nickname, by the name he'd like to be referred to always, 
as in a desperate attempt to remind him of their closeness, and maybe the honourable nature of the character that he's naming him after. Bukharin wrote, Koba, why do you need me to die? The other fact that lets you know what Stalin really thought is that Bukharin begged to be allowed to die by poison, or a cup of morphine in his poetic terms. Stalin not only had him shot, but the NKVD officers in charge of his execution forced him to watch other people getting shot first. Bukharin was executed in 1938. Bukharin's show trial had another important defendant, the former head of the NKVD, Yagoda. Such was the accelerating rate of the Stalinist purges, Yagoda had been demoted from head of the NKVD in 1936, arrested in 1937, and executed in 1938. So all-encompassing was the Great Terror that it consumed even key members of the NKVD that carried it out. The reason for getting rid of Yagoda are of course obvious, and again George Orwell's 1984, which after all was written as a satire or critique of the socialist system, provides us with the perfect metaphor. Incidentally, reading 1984 will give you as good an idea of any as understanding Stalin's Russia and terror as any fictional book. Emmanuel Goldstein and his endless, undefeatable conspiracy that dissidents are associated with, and forced to confess to associating with, and so on. It's a perfect metaphor for the endless Trotskyite accusations. Indeed, given the obvious anti-Semitism involved in the naming of the demonised figure, Goldstein is an obvious cipher for Trotsky. Plenty of scholars have pointed out that Goldstein's book is just like Trotsky's writings or a parody of them. The mysterious organisation he leads, the Brotherhood, may be real or may be a fabrication of the party leadership. We never find out but it serves the exact same purpose as the Trotskyites. Orwell himself, of course, was a socialist who had believed in a socialist utopia, but was utterly disillusioned with how it had been betrayed by the USSR, and subsumed into totalitarian control. Goldstein's book, The Secret Underground Pamphlet that Winston Smith reads in 1984, is a basic explanation of the principles of socialism, and, by the time 1984 is set, the society which claims to be socialist has suppressed even this philosophy, in flavour of blind and slavish loyalty to the party. In case it's not clear, I really love 1984. In that book, the protagonist Winston describes Doublethink, which is how citizens are supposed to deal with the information that are against the story they've been told by the state. You force yourself to forget it, and then you force yourself to forget the act of forgetting, and so on, and so on. The lie is always one step ahead of the truth. Stalin used Yugoda to purge the system of Zinoviev and Kamenev, and also Kirov. Then he uses Yezov to purge the system of Yugoda and his likely complicity in killing Kirov. And, spoiler alert, the poison dwarf will not die of natural causes either. It's very difficult for me to muster even the tiniest bit of sympathy for Yezov or Yagoda, but both must have known the full scale of the horror when it became clear that the purges were pinwheeling around to take them out. There would be no mercy for their friends, families or associates. Yagoda, perhaps sarcastically when he knew that he was doomed, told one of his investigators that there must be a god after all. After all, if Stalin was in charge, he deserved to be raised up for his loyal service to the regime. But if God was really calling the shots, well, he deserved his punishment. As Yagoda put it, look where I am and judge for yourself. In the Russia of the Great Terror, men sat in offices, inventing elaborate confessions for Stalin's enemies, while other men sat in other offices, writing elaborate confessions for those first men. The system erased all opposition, and then erased the evidence that the opposition had been erased. One of the most iconic images from this era is a doctored photo of Stalin and some associates. By 1939, Yezov had been removed from the picture completely. One year, the NKVD is singing your praises, literally singing your praises, and the next year you're being erased from pictures of you and Stalin. Enemies are not just defeated, but destroyed completely. History is not just suppressed, but rewritten. This was the ambitious goal of the Great Terror. And at its end, only Stalin and a few members of his inner circle survived. One of the important things to note about this is that Stalin made sure that all of those members of the inner circle that survived were equally complicit in the Great Terror. They all signed execution lists in their various regions. And when, after Stalin's death, Khrushchev denounced the Great Terror in the secret speech, there was a lot of arguing amongst Stalin's underlings because they had all been complicit and a lot of them felt like Khrushchev was trying to distance himself from something he'd been a part of. It's in the same way as ensuring membership of a cult by undergoing a murder together. The, the, the blood binds them together after this point. Now, one of the most important aspects of Yogoda's conviction is that in his confession, he implicated the next bunch of high-ranking officials who were going to be persecuted by the NKVD. These were the men of the Red Army. If amongst them, Marshal Tukhachevsky who Stalin had long suspected of plotting some kind of military coup against the revolution, 
again with very little evidence. He was arrested, and Yezov was put in charge of his interrogation, and Yezov was not afraid to use physical torture as well as psychological. Perhaps we'll never know for sure what precise techniques were used by the NKVD to wring a confession out of Tukhachevsky. What we do know is that the confession, which still survives in the Soviet archives, was spattered with blood. Stalin saw spies everywhere in the Red Army, and by the end of the purge, 30,000 members of the armed forces had been killed, and more than half of the officer corps. The purge of the army and Stalin's motivations behind ordering it are one of the murkier areas of the already murky Great Terror. For example, Tukhachevsky and others were accused of conspiring with officials from Nazi Germany in a plot to overthrow the state. Of course, this was the standard accusation that was levelled to everyone, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Bukharin, everyone had to deal with it. But there is solid evidence that the Nazis encouraged Stalin's paranoia in this area, in the hope that he'd decimate his own armed forces. Reinhard Heydrich, the brutal head of the SS, had 32 documents forged to make it look like Tukhachevsky had been involved in a plot to topple Stalin. Allowing Stalin to discover these forgeries gave him all the pretext he needed to ruthlessly purge the Red Army. That said, I don't believe, and most historians don't believe, that Stalin was genuinely duped by the Nazi forgeries. It just gave him an excuse to do what he wanted to do anyway, and crush any alternative centre of power. Yet the purge of the army remains, on the face of it, a considerable gamble by Stalin. Tukhachevsky was a brutal man, but he was a brilliant military strategist, who was beginning to understand what armour and aircraft would do to modern warfare. Something that Hitler, of course, and the architects of Blitzkrieg understood very well. That was why they designed their strategy of lightning war that utilised fast movement, aerial bombardment, and armour above all else. There was no question that Stalin's paranoia caused him to weaken his own army considerably. All this while the state was being squeezed to maximise military production. Given that there was probably no realistic coup, and Stalin knew that, it seems like a misstep. What's clear is that Stalin the autocrat shines through this action. He was willing to weaken the socialist state, the Russian military, and cut down military leaders who could be helpful in their prime. All this in order to terrify people, to increase their loyalty. Stalin would regularly say that the only way to win was to Jews were more terrified of their own side than they were of the enemy. And yet we can clearly see in this action that one of the flaws of dictators is that they often put a higher price on loyalty than competence. This will have its own consequences. There's so much to say in going through the Great Terror, so I split it into two episodes. Next time, I will dive into the impact of the Great Terror on ordinary people, not just Baltic politicians in the USSR. Because of this horrendous purging of society, it was not just limited to the party. In the USSR, Stalin, Yezov, and the NKVD, they made themselves the common enemy of mankind. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now. If you've enjoyed listening to the show, there's all kinds of things you can do to help, from telling all of your friends to following us on various social media accounts like Twitter and Facebook, visiting the website, donating to the show, leaving us a good review on iTunes. Any of these things will help the show, which is, after all, just me sat in my room reading books and talking about them. Uh, see you next time.